Well, good morning, church. I hope you're doing well. We are in this little series, a short series called Grow, and we're talking about following Jesus looks a little different depending on your stage of life. So in the first half of life, uh, generally we're full of energy and enthusiasm, and following Jesus looks kind of like that. Just go to a high school or graduation or, or college graduation, and you will feel this palpable sense of expectation in the air, that there's a lot of drive. Young people get this sense that they're going to conquer the world, and so there is. Uh, it feels like just over the horizon, there are jobs and careers and degrees and dreams, and young people have the intellect and the motivation and the health to go achieve these goals. This is the first half of life, a lot of energy. And then most people, as they age, they hit this point, and I, I'm not saying it's a midlife crisis, that would probably come later. I'm actually saying at some point, often in late 20s, sometimes 30s, sometimes 40s, a lot of people hit this point in their life where they realize, oh, I've got to keep doing the same thing, like over and over and over, day after day after day. And it dawns on us that, oh, this, it's going to be a marathon, and it's not quite going to be what I thought it was going to be. So here's how this uh, played out in my life. I had a five-year period where I checked off a lot of the boxes that our culture says we're supposed to check off in Western society. So I got my bachelor's degree, my master's degree, got married, first kid, first home, all within, the five, within a five-year period. And so you think, oh, this is great. I'm doing everything I'm supposed to be doing. This is wonderful. I've, I've achieved the culmination of life. I have a very distinct memory towards the end of this, these years where I'm on a speaking trip, engage, speaking engagement trip, and I'm in a hotel bathroom, and I am exhausted, and it's the only time of the entire day when I have just like two to three minutes to communicate to Mary, and I'm so frustrated that I remember Mary took this picture of me years ago. So here's this first picture. So I'm very frustrated. Now, why would, well, that's weird, Phil. Why would, why would you be in a hotel bathroom, huddled, whispering, having, you know, two minutes of conversation? Why don't you just talk throughout the course of the day? Well, the reason is because my children happen to be at this stage. So put this picture up. So you parents know what this is like. Is this all day long? You're just constantly taking care of these toddlers, and you don't have any time to talk to your spouse. And so I just, I very distinctly remember what is going on with my life? I, I thought that it would be one way, but it is clearly not that way anymore. The, the middle years of life truly are a slog. It's hard. So what is, what's the content of this phase of life? It's marked by heavy responsibility, by duty. You do the same things over and over. You have a home, a yard, a mortgage, a car, an air conditioner that's about to go out. You have a spouse that needs your attention. You have kids that need your attention. You have a career that gets increasingly demanding. Dinner doesn't happen unless you make it. Bills don't get paid unless you pay them. The bathroom doesn't get cleaned unless you clean it. Diapers don't get changed unless you change them. Can I get an amen from anybody? Anybody. So for young people excited about adulthood, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you might want to temper your expectations. It's a grind. And then for those of you that find yourself in these long decades of midlife, you're familiar with words like disappointment and fatigue, boredom, frustration, resentment. You might feel like you do all the work and nobody notices. You feel taken for granted of, used by others, underappreciated. You thought your life would be one thing, but then you got there and it's not quite what you expected. Henry David Thoreau puts it this way, the youth gets together his materials to build a bridge to the moon or perchance a palace or temple on the earth. And at length, the middle-aged man concludes to build a woodshed with them. It's a poetic way to describe something that is very common and familiar to so many, many people. You think it's going to be one way, we're going to shoot for the moon, and then you get halfway through life, well, I'm going to build a shed in the backyard. 
Ron Rollheiser, who I've been quoting several times over the last few weeks, puts it like this. When the honeymoon dies, and by honeymoon he means the first half of life, the big dream is over, and we realize we can defy gravity only in our dreams because in reality our lives come down to this singular person, this singular family, this one city, this too small house, this less than fulfilling job, this irritating mortgage, these non-famous friends, and this less than perfect body. Aren't you glad you came to church today? (laughs) Often the first half of life is plagued by the ailments of the younger brother in Luke 15. Misplaced passion, lust, disordered loves. But in the second half of life, we are plagued by the ailments of the older brother. Let's take a look at the older brother from Luke 15, starting in verse 25. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard the music and the dancing, so he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother's come, he replied, and your father's killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in, so his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, All these years I've been slaving for you, never disobeying your orders, and yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could go celebrate with my friends. But when this young son of yours who squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. There's lots of things in this paragraph to notice. First thing I want to point out is how the older brother connects with this theme of the second half of life. There's a few phrases that stand out to me. One of them is this, all these years. Like you can just hear the misery (laughs) in his voice. Day after day after day, I've been slaving away for you, dad. And that phrase, I've been slaving away for you, reminds me of the mother of the eight-year-old boy who's doing something dumb. And she just, she just kind of has, she reaches her breaking point and she just flips. Like you can imagine her in the kitchen just starting to yell at her eight-year-old son. Like, I've been slaving for you for all these years and you have no idea how many tantrums of you that I've endured. You have no idea how many diapers I've changed. You have no many times I have swept this floor with the macaroni that you littered day after day after day. You can imagine that. I'm not saying that's you. But in some sense, we all have a moment where we feel that way. So the older brother, he's been carrying all this responsibility for a long time. He never rebelled. He never called in sick. Whether it was managing servants or tending sheep or sweeping the barn floor or plowing the field or fixing the fence, he was the picture of duty. He was always there, and now he's not happy. Second thing I want you to notice from this text is what exactly is his weakness or his besetting sin? What is his downfall? I don't know if you've ever noticed, but it's, it's actually in the text. It's the first phrase that the father uses to describe the older brother, or at least the first phrase the narrator uses to describe the older brother. Here it is. The older brother brother became, say this word with me, angry. Angry. See, the first half of life is often the struggle with lust in its many forms, but the second half of life, our struggle is with anger. So what are we angry about? Well, you might be angry because you've worked really hard at your job for 15 years, but people that came into your company after you have been promoted ahead of you. Or maybe you're angry because you saved for months to go on a vacation to the mountains, but now you're using that money on a termite infestation. Angry. Or you're angry because you've tried so hard to date in the right way to find that 
person who would be your significant other for the rest of your life, but time after time, it doesn't work out. So you're frustrated. Or maybe you're angry because you spent year after year after year educating yourself, doing research, reading books, and you have developed really well thought out, reasoned opinions and beliefs about God, about life, about reality. But you have a lot of your friends who disagree with your opinions, and you're angry about it. Or maybe you're angry because you've spent all this money and all these hours trying to be a good mom or trying to be a good dad, only to find your kids have grown up and they have rebelled against the very values that you believe deeply in your heart. So you're angry. Now, maybe your anger is not that pronounced. Maybe for you it's a lot more subtle. So anger, on the one hand, it could be a bonfire. But on the other hand, anger can be like coals. It It can smolder. And the reality is... Smoldering anger lasts a lot longer than the bonfire kind of anger. A few weeks from now, most of us who are Thunder fans will probably be less angry than we were last night if you were watching the game. That's bonfire anger. But there's other issues in your life that a month from now, two months from now, they're still going to be there. They're going to fester. So, Speaking of smoldering anger, back to the text, notice this interesting part of the story. The younger brother is the same gender as the older brother. It's often very hard for people in midlife to celebrate with people of the same gender that are younger. This can be a sign of smoldering anger. So let me ask you, moms in your 30s and 40s, do you ever find it difficult to celebrate with an an honor and congratulate young, wrinkle-free moms holding their infants? Or do you find it difficult to go into the home of a woman who's younger than you, and the home is more beautiful than your home, and you find it difficult to celebrate with her? Or men, do you find it difficult when people in your workplace come up under you, and they do great, and you find it really hard to celebrate their success? If so, it could be that there is a smoldering anger in your heart because life didn't turn out to be quite as good as you thought it would be. So third thing I want to point out from this text is I want you to think about the consequences of smoldering anger. So visualize the story in your head. Where exactly is the older brother? Well, he's not in the father's house. So the older brother is actually supposed to be the one that's closest to the father. He has spent all these years developing this amazing relationship with his dad. He's supposed to be in the house close to his dad, but he's out in the field. Well, the reason is because he's mad. It's not because he partied his life away. It's because he's angry. And so the truth is, anger is just as much of a barrier to the heart of God as lust. So this can explain another feature that I've observed of midlife. I often hear this sentiment from people in midlife. I thought I'd be closer to God at this point of life than I actually am. Or I thought growing older was a guarantee of growing wiser, but that hasn't really happened. Why am I not as close to God as I want to be? There's a lot of answers to that question, but one is that your anger towards life has become unconscious anger towards God. Paul put it brilliantly in Ephesians 4 when he said this, Do not let the sun go down while you are angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. In other words, anger becomes an opening for the work of the enemy in your heart. Or another metaphor would be anger is like a heavy chain around the neck of someone that wants to grow closer to God. I mean, think about all the examples of people in the Bible that do walk with the Lord well. They're not mad. So, what do we do in midlife? You're sitting there, your dreams have not been realized, you are frustrated, you're in these long middle years of responsibility and duty, and day after day you're doing the same thing, and you feel taken for granted of, you feel like no one notices you, you feel underappreciated, and you're just seething, very low level, day after day after day. What, what do we do about these years of our life? I'll tell you a story, and then I, I'm going to go back to the text, but I heard this story just a few weeks ago. Anthony Ray 
Hinton was a man that was in Alabama death row for 30 years because he was falsely convicted of a crime. Well, new evidence emerged, and then the, his, court, his case was reopened. It actually went all the way up to the Supreme Court, and then he was found innocent, and he was released after 30 years. So he wrote a book about his experience. There's a, a pretty remarkable things happened in those 30 years. He, he talks about the very first day he got to jail, and it was about midnight, and all the other inmates started banging on the bars of their cells, and he didn't know what was happening. And then he heard feet scuffle down the hallway, and apparently someone was actually being executed that night, going to the electric chair. So later he asked a fellow inmate, why did everybody clang on the bars? And the inmate said, well, when people walk down that hallway to the electric chair, we make the noise to let that person know they're not alone to the very end. In these 30 years, Anthony saw 54 people go to the electric chair. So about 15 years into this 30-year sentence, a really interesting guy got put on his hallway. It was a man named Henry. Henry was one of the leaders of the KKK in Alabama. He had just been convicted of first-degree murder. He had gone out and senselessly killed a black man. So Henry comes in and is filled with hate towards people like Anthony. Henry calls Anthony a derogatory term over and over and over again, but Anthony had learned something those first 15 years, and he talks about this. The thing he had learned was this. Every day when you wake up, you have a choice. You can choose to engage the anger, or you can choose to engage the forgiveness, but, but it's a choice every single day. And so even though Henry, the KKK leader, hated Anthony, Anthony did not hate him back. And day after day, he treated him with dignity and with kindness. And about 10 years later, Henry started to have a change of heart. It took a long time. Henry stopped using that term. Henry started talking to Anthony, and eventually they became really, really good friends. Well, Anthony did finally get released because he had been convicted of a crime he did not commit, but not the same for Henry. Henry did go to the electric chair. And so the day of his execution, the executioner asked him, do you have any final words? Well, Henry had just come out of his cell. He had had his final meal. He had given a hug to Anthony one last time. Here was the final words of Henry before he was executed. He said, all of my life I was taught to hate. And all of my life, my mother and my father and my community taught me to hate. The very people that the very people they taught me to hate have shown me nothing but love. So tonight, as I leave this world, I leave this world now knowing what real love feels like. So it was a choice. Anthony could wake up every day mad, or he could wake up every day choosing a different posture. And Henry learned the same thing. It, it's choice. One of the things that Philip Yancey said when he was here a few weeks ago that I kept thinking about was, he said, I'd like to write a book someday based on the question, what would happen if the older brother got it right? What a, what a captivating thought. And ever since he said that, I've been thinking, what would it look like if the older brother got it right? And so I went back to the text, and I wrote down one possibility of how the story might change if the older brother had got it right. So it might go something like this. This son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. So that's straight from Luke 15, as is this next line. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. Now this is where, in my imagination, here's what could have been different. So this is not the NIV. This is the PBV, Phil Brooklyn version. Here we go. So meanwhile, the older son was out in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. His first reaction was that familiar feeling of bitterness. Why does my brother, who does everything wrong, get a party? And I do everything right, and I get nothing. But then he looked into the field that he'd plowed hundreds of times, and he saw the thorns and the weeds 
he could never seem to get rid of, but also the grapes and the figs, which had become a great source of delight for his children. He looked at the fence that he rebuilt a dozen times, which was never as sturdy as he wanted it to be, but nevertheless did protect his field. And then he turned to his father, looked into his father's watery eyes, and he knew that despite his own imperfect heart, that his father did love him. And the older brother made a decision. He chose not to engage his anger, but rather to access something else in his soul, his own capacity to forgive. So while the music for his brother's party played in the background, he stood there in that field with his father and decided to forgive. He forgave the ground for being hard. He forgave the fence for breaking down. He forgave the weeds for coming back. He forgave his brother for rebelling. He forgave himself for being bitter for so long. He forgave life itself for being unfair. And then he walked arm in arm with his father into the house to truly celebrate. So maybe that's what it would have been like if the older brother had got it right. So what about you? What if, what if you get it right? What would that look like? Like I know for a fact <laughs> But for many of you, life's been really, really hard, and it, it hasn't been fair. And I know that. But the mature disciple of Jesus, especially in these long middle years, must learn to embrace forgiveness as an all-encompassing posture towards life. See, forgiveness is not just something you do when someone does something wrong to you. It's not just situational or momentary. Forgiveness is a posture that you wake up in the morning and you have to apply to your life as it comes to you. It's an attitude of the heart. It's a quality of being that does not demand life to be a certain way, but simply embraces life as it comes. A forgiving heart does not give negativity a foothold. It doesn't become a host for negativity because, you see, without a host— Negativity, just like a disease, can't exist. It will die. So let me ask you, which part of your life do you need to forgive today? Do you need to forgive your friends for not being everything that you need? Do you need to forgive your spouse for not being everything that you wanted? Do you need to forgive your body for not aging the way that you thought that it would? Do you need to forgive your kids? Do you need to forgive your career, your home? Do you need to forgive the church? Do you need to forgive God? Do you need to forgive yourself? Who do you need to forgive? If you bow with me in prayer, Father, we stand with you just like the older brother did, with a choice. We can choose, like we do many days, to be bitter that life didn't go the way that we wanted it to. We can be bitter at our coworkers, bitter at our house for breaking down, for our bodies for falling apart, bitter for opportunities that never panned out, bitter for dreams that never realized. Or... We can practice this different kind of posture, this benevolence and generosity towards life, this posture which has us wake up every day and praise you for the glory of another day. So Father, I know for a fact there are many, many bitter and angry hearts in the room, and so I pray that just for a moment today you can help us to take a deep breath and to embrace this posture of forgiveness. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. So we're going to sing now, and if you need to pray with someone today, our shepherds understand the complexity of life, and they want to be with you and to listen to you and to pray with you, and we'll have a shepherd at each exit if you need to go pray with someone. And then if you'd like to get baptized, I'd like to encourage you to come down to the front, and we would love to celebrate your birth into Christ this morning. Let's stand and sing.